Okay, so I'm going to start talking today about a topic that's going to follow us through uh, a bunch of the subsequent lectures, and um, I think it's going to be something we're going to be coming back to for the balance of the semester from time to time. And that is this topic of test design. At the end of the day, when it comes down to testing, you could talk all you want about levels of testing and you know a unit and unit integration and integration level and system level and acceptance level you could talk about black box and, and glass box um, all those are good and in fact I'll be hitting on some of those during this lecture but at the end of the day when you're coming up with test tests you have to come up with concrete test cases you have to come up with, I'm going to test the system in this specific way. And when I say this specific way, I'm talking about specific inputs to the system. That occurs just as much at the function or method level, where the inputs might be what? At the function or method level, what, what are the inputs you're testing a function with? The begins with P, or alternatively you can say it with A. Technically it's more appropriate to say it with A. It is an R. It is a G. Arguments? Yes, the arguments. <laughs> Thank you. So you test it with certain arguments to the function. Right? You have a function that performs the square root of a number and you give it different values to take square roots of. Different numbers. Right? You have a function which computes if a number is prime and you give it no different numbers. Those are the inputs and you see if it gives the right result. Well, those aren't all of the inputs at a function level. Why do I say that? What else could be an input at a function level besides just the arguments? Is it possible the function might depend on things that are not in the arguments? Think a language like C. What might it depend on? It begins with a G. There's an L after it. It has an L at its end. There's a B in the middle. Global variables. global variables. You got it. You got it. No hangman here. Um, okay, so global variables, ladies and gentlemen. It could depend on global variables. And those are a type of input for some functions as well that need to be specified for it to be totally reproducible. If it depends on a global variable and you want to run the function twice and get exactly the same answer, you've got to be sure that that global variable is set to the same value each time. Right? It's part of the input of the function. Now, if I'm dealing with a web app and I have a form that I'm going to submit and said search, right, within some document for something, say, what might be the inputs on that form? Think about web forms. What are often on web forms? Drop down menus. Drop down menus. Text fields. You know, these little radio buttons. You can pick an o a set of options or check boxes, right? Um, these, are, these are different types of inputs for a web form. That's kind of uh, at, the, at the higher level. At the end of the day, we're coming up with test cases that specify for particular inputs, what do we expect to happen as a result, right? And what's the, what are, we, what are we trying to determine with the test? So maybe we have a square root function. We give it a, a negative number, and we see if it returns a complex value or specifically a, a, an imaginary value. Okay, I don't know you folks who take courses with imaginary numbers. But, um, or, you have a, um, or you have a function which tests if one string is a subset of another string, and you give it you give it a string that's you know bigger than the second string. The first string is bigger than the, the string to find. The string to try to find is bigger than the string in which to find it. And it's a very particular string in each. And you're trying to see does it handle gracefully the case where the string you're trying to find is bigger than the other one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't crash. Right? Okay. So those are test cases. We're going to be talking about how you come up with those test cases. Jesse, as part of deliverable one, had a list of test cases. 
they were they were more abstractly described, uh, but they were helpful. Like if a connection, if a disconnection occurs at this certain time, test the app under that circumstance. But that's that's good. That's kind of hints as to what the test case will be. But at the end of the day, it's a very particular test case that's run. Like you're you're disconnecting at this specific point in the operation. You're seeing how it matters. So we're going to be talking about test design. We're going to be talking about a bunch of lectures in test design, which go through ways you pick your tests. You pick your test <laughs> cases. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. um, so I alluded to the fact that there's different levels of testing. One of them is what we call black box testing. And, and a way to think about it is it's behavioral testing. We're testing, does the system do what it's supposed to do? What? What it is supposed to do? And we often call this black box testing. Why do we call it black box? Because we're only testing the required, like from the requirements we're not looking Good. Really good. Yeah, we're, t we're testing, does the design, indeed implementation, match the requirements? In fact, is, is it matching up with its requirements? We're not looking how the code is implementing, implemented. We're just looking, does it do what it promises it's supposed to do? And what promises it? The requirements, ladies and gentlemen. The requirements. Mm. So here we're seeing often how the program reacts from the user's perspective. That would be from a, a high level. It it often requires some domain knowledge, like some knowledge about what's, what it's supposed to do, who the clinicians are that are using it or whatever. Um, and uh, it can be quite specialized. Like you can do performance testing or security testing. What might be something you could do on the security side, for example? Suppose you have a search query. What might you do? It's being searching a database. What sort of string might you put in there if you're concerned about security? Password or salt or? Okay, I, I, I like what I'm hearing. Salting associated with passwords Hash. and uh, okay, yeah, and hashing and salting are used to, to uh, obscure passwords. That's good knowledge. But what I'm talking about here is if, if you're testing something with that, often you're trying to test security vulnerabilities you will often test with, for SQL injection attacks. Is that so it's like you've heard of before? Yeah, you inject some code where it essentially spits out everything. Yeah, and what do you inject? You inject some SQL code. Why would you do that? Because the code, if it's naively written, there's this string the user pays in, right? And then when the user pays it and presses submit, if they're searching and it's going to search in a database, what's going to happen? That's going to be turned. That string is going to become part of a what? An, S an SQL statement. But and if, but if you call an S if the idea behind SQL injection is yeah. that you make an SQL statement that it calls that it can use to get everything. Yeah, and so the idea is, look, so maybe you expect, this is on a website, and you expect the user to put in something like, they want to find blankets and it will look in the database for all the products that have blanket in it right but maybe the user is malicious and they put into their search instead of saying blanket they say star from users <laughs> and and then they put an sql comment sign that will comment out everything after that and if that string is pasted into an SQL statement. The SQL statement turns from being, you know, select blankets from products table, you know, in this way, into select star from users, and all the rest is commented out. And guess what it gets? All the user information, which might include credit card information or other things. It's a nasty world out there. People do that. And so here, security testing requires you to have some knowledge about what are vulnerabilities and how to perform it through the black box, in a black box way. 
So it can be quite technical. It's not necessarily a, you know, a thing where you get a bunch of monkeys to pound on it. It can be quite technical what you test for in a black box way. Alternatively, you can test in a way that's called glass box testing. And how is this different from black, bo from black box? Can anyone say? You actually read the implementation this time? Yeah, you're looking at the implementation. How does it work? Not just what is it promise, but how does it work? And you're using that information, knowledge of how it works. Oh, it's calling this function. It's performing this algorithm. And that gives you ideas for extra test cases for extra ideas for test cases, okay? And there's a thing called gray box testing, which is where you have partial implementation knowledge. Okay, let's talk about black box testing. Um, black box testing, you can start, as Jesse has, to his good name once the requirements are complete. You can enlist users and less computer trained individuals often to engage in black box testing. We do this a lot with the products that come out of our lab. We have people in our lab who pound on them. They weren't involved in building them. They don't know about the code, but they'll give it various cases and they'll see how it responds, okay? Um, and and they'll, they'll try it and they'll see if weird things happen. And if weird things happen, they'll try to make more weird things happen until it crashes or what have you or they'll report problems. So we had one session, I think we had about six or seven people in it. It was maybe a two hour session for one of our projects and it found about 50 bugs, 50 distinct, mostly distinct um, defect reports came out of it. Pretty effective, pretty effective. People just pounding on it. They found weird things in it. Why is the only type of jam listed in terms of nutritional composition, apricot jam. Just seems w weird. It shouldn't be the only, only thing listed, et cetera. They don't necessarily know a lot about the system, but they could sometimes for, for security testing or performance testing. Okay, um, so when it comes to black box testing, we're gonna be talking about this a fair bit today, but it turns out that what we're gonna be talking about, the principles, in a pattern that's gonna follow us through the next several lectures. What we're talking about at the level of black box testing can also be applied at the level of glass box testing. Okay? Um, it turns out the same basic principles can be applied there. I'm gonna to emphasize today black box testing, but we'll see some how some of these principles can carry over. Okay. Um, so, what two that I'm going to be talking about today that I'm going to get to are equivalence partitioning and boundary value testing. These kind of go together. Boundary values are often, not always, the boundary between equivalence classes. And then we'll go on and talk about orthogonal arrays and decision tables and, 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 and random testing, et cetera. Okay. Um, so we'll emphasize that. Glass box tests are often ones that will take advantage of knowing how the system is built. So they'll focus on problematic modules, modules which have been buggy in the past, corner cases in terms of the libraries involved maybe, um, observing values halfway through the computation, confirming that okay, we've tested it when, it, and when this if statement is true and when it's false. In other words, when it goes to the, what's called the conditional and the consequent. Consequent, excuse me, the alternative, what am I saying? Consequent and alternative, okay? Um, okay, so let's talk about equivalence classes, okay? The idea uh, of equivalence classes is a pretty simple one. And I'll start it actually with an example. Um, suppose I wanna, suppose I have a square root function. I'm testing a square root function. What values might I give it to test it? Okay, so it's a good, good example to test it. If, if I didn't include minus one particularly and I, and I did minus two, would it be a big problem? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. What do I want to do at least one of? A negative number. A negative number, right? If, 
if, if this promises to work with negative numbers, to, to, have, to pass the red face test, to have any sense of credibility, I've got to test it with at least one negative number. What's another thing I should test it with? Zero. Okay, good, zero. Does it behave properly for this fixed point of the square root function? Fixed point in the sense that square root of zero is zero. What's another number I might like to test it with along those same lines? Positive number. Yeah. What's a very special positive number? Where again, it's a fixed point of square root. One. One. Square root of one is one. What other things might I test it with though? Uh, perfect squares. Perfect squares. 16, 25, 9, right? 36, 144, et cetera, right? Make sure it gives back appropriate values. How about other numbers to test it with? Prime numbers. Okay, primes, yeah, that would be interesting. Maybe try it with, do I have to try it with all primes? No. Good thing, right? Because it would never finish. Do I have to test it with all squares? No. If I trusted it with a couple, would you have greater confidence that it works? Yeah. If you Suppose you didn't test it at all with any non-squares, any things that aren't perfect squares, I should say. If you, if you didn't test it with a single, all the numbers you tested it with were perfect squares, would that, say for the positives, would that, would that make you feel you've thoroughly tested the function? No. You couldn't pass the red face test. You couldn't you couldn't say seriously you've tested this thing intensively, right? But do you have to test all of them? No, you just need a couple. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the notion of equivalence classes. There are these kind of sets of classes of numbers, these sets of numbers that are similar in some way. In what way are they similar? Well, if they test the same condition, they kind of make the code go through the same pathways in terms of the if and for loop and, you know, in terms of uh, iteration. Think about it this way. If there's a problem with one of them, probably it's a problem with, might well be a problem with the others. Or if one works, it makes it much more likely that the others work. Um, do, maybe they maintain the same value of predicates or they cause the same events. The, for a square root function, what it means to, in terms of equivalence classes is, is different than if it's something that, you know, is gonna handle UI input. But the point is there's ones that, if, if one of them ca uh, causes a failure, the others are likely to cause similar failures, more likely than not. They're kind of similar in some way. And these are a bunch of ways they could be similar without going into it, listed up there, right? They yield similar outcomes, they lead, to the same return value. They cause similar events to happen. They throw similar exceptions, et cetera. You know what I mean? Okay, so, so let's, 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 let's talk about these. Um, uh, okay, so suppose there's a web form, in which case a user can enter their integer age as part of the form. So it says, what is your current age? And suppose it's a free text input. They don't choose it from a list. They, they specify it as text. Give me some things that you might test it with. This is a web form. This is for interaction with users. Dollar sign. Okay, sure, dollar sign. That's, that's not a valid age. And that's good that you're testing something that's not a valid age because you can't prevent users from making mistakes. You can't prevent them from entering things that are, seem weird to you. So dollar sign is good. What's another thing? Alphanumeric. Okay, so they enter something maybe that has alpha characters in addition to numeric characters. You know, so NDO 885, right? Yeah. Um, and you see, you see what happens. How about other things? Um, negative integer. Okay, negative integer, good. Good, do you have to try it with all negative integers? No, no but if you try it with a one or maybe a very small number, you, you'll have strong confidence. You'll have reason for confidence that it handles that sort of thing, right? How about another thing? Three and a half. Okay. Float. Yeah, three and a half. Great. A float? Yeah. The maximum, positive, maximum value of an integer plus one. 
Okay, okay, good. Yeah, you see, I love it. You folks are thinking exactly the right way. I want you to think when creating test cases. Um, when testing Mo's code and the code of anyone else. Um, uh, these are the what you should be thinking about, yeah? Ages that don't make sense, i.e. zero, or like over like 150 maybe. Okay, okay, yeah, look, Methuselah, it's like 200 years old. So I remember when I was in grad school, some, there was another grad student talking about who was on their, we have these things called uh, thesis committees or dissertation committees and the people who judge your thesis. And one of them said, I have a certain faculty member. And someone else said, isn't he like 900 years old? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he was a very good faculty member. But um, uh, yeah, okay, so maybe over 150, you, you test it, I mean, what, what happens? Um, zero? Well, you could argue, okay, a zero a valid age. It's unlikely to be the person themselves entering it, right? Um, but, uh, you know, it ma makes you think about it. So you folks are thinking in the right ways. And the point is, we test these classes of things. You have a couple, maybe, of each type, right? A couple negative values, maybe, maybe just one. A couple reasonable values, right? Integers between one and some reasonable upper limit, 130 or whatever, and some that are invalid. Why do you have to do invalid ones? I mentioned it earlier, but why do you have to do invalid ones? Users are stupid. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way. Users make mistakes. Everyone here has made mistakes as a user. Sometimes it's not obvious what the system wants. Um, and users will do things, and we can't control them. Like it or not, you can't control it. So the system has to be mature. It has to be able to handle these things. So that's good. So, um, you know, in general, you will be thinking about equivalence classes. If you were dealing with an airplane cabin, you might allow the user to say, okay, what part of the cabin do they want to be in? So it's, are, are they getting a first class ticket or a coach? or a business class or coach ticket, sort of economy class, business class. Um, do they want aisle seat, window seat, or middle seat? Mm -hmm. um, but you're not going to test every possible one. Maybe you'll allow them to specify particular seats if they want. But you might uh, try it with a couple from the first class or the business class area, a couple from the economy area. Um, in each case from each of the aisle and, and uh, window seats. And you want to make sure that, you know, if you request a middle seat up here in business class where there aren't any, it will give you an appropriate message saying, hey, there's no middle seat, or it doesn't show you that option, right? You want to you wanna say, okay, I'm in business class. Does it only show you aisle or window in that case? So you want to be testing it out on cases that are classes of things. You can't do exhaustive testing, but you can at least not do bad testing, not do impoverished testing, not do pathetic testing. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what I want from this class. That's what I want from your team. I don't want pathetic testing. Please, please, okay? Don't make me leap up in shock. So you select at least one representative from each equivalence class. Okay, coach aisle, coach window, coach middle, business class aisle, business class window. You don't have to test every single seat, but at least test that, right? So you can pass the red face test. Yeah, you tested the uh, site works properly for business class tickets. You tested it works properly for for economy tickets and for both window and aisle, it gets the right type of seed, et cetera. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, here it's very important to say you want to make sure, if possible, you test invalid cases because the user can give you invalid cases. By the way, this is less clear when you're doing testing involving methods. So if Mo's, if Mo has a method, or more generally, determine a function. If it is a method, he has a method where it says 
this first argument must be non-null. There's different attitudes towards that. Some say, well, he's got to be mature in handling it, even if it's null. But for a lot of programmers, they say, look, this is a contract. And just like for FedEx, they guarantee delivery of a package. If it's brought in by a certain time, they guarantee delivery anywhere in Canada by a certain time the next day. You got to bring it in by this, by you know the uh, that certain time, and it doesn't make promises otherwise. You know the shop might not even be open or something. So, so it's not clear. And I would say I'll be fine if Mo has nice specifications, and Jesse gives you only arguments to match your preconditions. It's a good reason for Mo to write down indeed his preconditions so that I could see the tests that there's not tests missing because the tests now are all living within his preconditions. Otherwise I might say, well, give it a negative number. Why didn't you give it a negative number? Why didn't you give it a null value? Okay. Um, okay. So look, if you're testing, this is the beauty of it. For any application like this, you can test it at a black box level. I can test it at a black box level. My TA, people out there in that room full of hardworking students can test it at a black box level, right? Um, but we can also test it at the level of implementation, at the level of glass box, okay? Um, so here, if you're doing it on forms or on an app, Look for equivalence classes for each input field. For each thing you're entering, look for that. So what's a what's an equivalence class? Okay, so right now you've got this Java code for this prototype. Kind of a half prototype, I'd say, since it's not with it's not in React Native, but it's a kind of prototype. It's a Java prototype. You've got it scanning QR codes. Great. What what are some equivalence classes you might try it with? Uh, barcodes. Okay. Yeah. You give it something. Ain't a QR code, but maybe triggers somehow other functionality with it. What's another thing? Uh, QR code that doesn't have information in it. Good. Yeah. QR code is not in a database. Give me something else. Beautiful. I like that one a lot. What's something else? Uh, a QR code that has information in the database. Okay. Yeah. Good. You always want to think about testing the things that it should be able to handle. What's another thing? Uh, a random thing that has no relevance to a QR code. Good, yeah. Okay, good, another one. QR code, maybe that's, you're so close, it, only part of it shows up or something like that. Um, so, or it's it's very, very small, you're doing it from too far away, just see what, see what happens, make sure it, it doesn't, you know, wig out or something, right? Um, the ones you had mentioned earlier are the most important ones. But trying it out to make sure it's fairly robust is good. It's good. Make sure the library isn't going to crash on weird cases or something, which case you might want to use a, another library, right? So look for equivalence classes. Maybe a QR code at different angles, right? How about that? A QR code that's upside down in some weird way, or it's at, a, at an on angle. Should it be able to handle that? I would hope so. In the hospital, who knows what angle people are gonna be putting their phone at. Does that make sense? Try it at different angles. So consider equivalence class for invalid inputs, maybe organize them in a table or outline, maybe a Google Sheets, Jesse, yeah, like you've shown. Ranges of values, like between this and this for a age form or something. Um, think about what what things are hand, should be handled in similar ways, right? Um, um, and um, you know, equivalence class. Okay, so that's good. Um, so here's you know an example of of equivalence classes for an age form. You know between one and ninety nine. Maybe it's invalid greater than ninety nine, zero. Otherwise. Um, Maybe you enter a calculation, five minus five or something like that, negative numbers, letters, maybe letters with things that could be wild cards in them. What the heck, maybe 
try putting some SQL code in there. Eh? Just see if you can make it ex freak out on the user, right? See if you can make the app exhibit displeasure of the most extreme sort. You can imagine what that looks like, app displeasure, but it might show a weird message to the user, which would freak them out and make them less, the, le the app less beloved for their family, right? Um, and then you might have very valid, valid cases for things, right? So, so think about these things. Once you, I, you're thinking the right way, and that's great. Okay, here's a count instances function. What does this exist to do? It counts the instances of string find in within, oh sorry, um, string being found within string find in. Counts the number of times str being found is inside str find in. Give me, and you notice it restricts it, right? Both must be not null, non-null. The function returns the count of the occurrences of this inside that. Does that make sense? These are strings. Okay, what are some equivalence classes here? How might you test this? So you're not, it's not embarrassingly bad. Star being found is greater than star find in. Okay, these are strings. What do you mean by greater than? The more letters. More okay, yeah, so it's, it's longer. I like that. That's good. What do you expect it to return? Remember, very important thing. Each test case, you give it input, and what should you be specifying? What the user expects the outcome. Yeah, what, what the outcome should be. Good. Well, so what did the outcome be for that? Zero. Zero, yeah, because it didn't find it in there. What other ones would, might be tested with? Your substring, like you have half the substring in the... Good. String. Okay, so so str being found may be AA and well, str find in is is includes a bunch of A's but never two in a row or something. Yeah. Um good. So I so I like that. How about how about some others? Um stir being found is a uh, length of one. Okay. Um and stir find in. Okay, okay. Now, what should that return? So, so that's kind of a, a group of test cases. Give me a, a very particular test case. Oh, uh, they're the exact same. Well, okay, but I mean a, a very specific test case. It tells me exactly what I'm testing. Uh, this is the key thing. When I say test case, I mean like, give me the precise input. So, give me a precise input for stir be found. A. A. I stir find it as A. Good. What should that return? One. Good. Give me another precise input. Uh, stir being found is A, stir find in is B. Good. What should that return? Zero. Good. Give me another one. Stir find in is A, stir find being found is capital A. Good. I love it. I love it. That's great. Um, what should that return? Depends on how you define it. Good. So provide some suggestions on sharpening the description, right? Yeah. Is it case insensitive or case sensitive? Love it. You could sharpen that. And often these things force you, like, is zero a valid age? It forces you to think through these things. It's one of the reasons we write tests before the code often, because it forces you to think through the possibility. How about another one? Oh. Um, Still being found is a space. Okay. And start finding is A and a tab. And Good. Okay. I I like that. What should that return? It should return zero. Okay. Good. Good. What? Well, how about another one? Stir find in has a new line, and stir being found is a character term. Good. I I like it. What should that return? Zero. Okay. Yeah. But you folks are okay. So this is excellent. I like your suggestions, but I will say you're missing some really big ones. Like, we're, we're just scratching the surface. There's some very basic ones we're not yet talking about. Uh, you're giving me some nice creative examples, and I appreciate that. But what are some, what are some basic ones? Jesse suggested stir being found being length one. Great. We tested a bunch of length ones. Is, mm -hmm. Stir being found being length two. Good. 
stir finding could be greater than length two. Okay, so give me some concrete examples. So AA would be stir being found and stir finding could be crocodile. Okay, good. What should that return? Zero. Good. Okay. Give me another. Uh, AA for stir being found. Yeah. Stir finding is hard bark. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Spelled with lowercase, let's say. Yeah. What should it return? I think there's only one character. <laughs> yeah, there's only one. Okay. Give me one that it's kind of an interesting case. You're actually... You're, you're really, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Is it going to work? Or you might, it might be a bit of suspense, even if it's basically working. AA and AAA? Yeah. Okay, so AA is stir being found. Stir find in is AAA. Three A's. What should that return? Two? Good. But because they're overlapping, right? Like, this, the first is AA. The second AA overlaps with the first one. Does that make sense? Um, may, maybe the algorithm would miss it. Maybe it tries to be clever on kind of look forward in some way. And I, there's some really nice, clever string finding algorithms, but sometimes if you implement them, you can make a mistake. Wouldn't the solution just be look, to look at it from the opposite end? What? So like if you're looking for A, A, you look for the first A, you look if there's an A before it. Yeah. If not, you move to the next A. Yeah. Then you choose that A, you look before it, and you find one. Yeah. Then you say, okay, that's done. So then you go to the next A, and then you look before it. And then yeah. You find one. Yeah. And, and, and a good string finding algorithm will advance the right level. And actually, sometimes it can advance by more than one, because it actually knows there's no A in there, or what have you. But yes, um, there, there are very clever ways to do it. But occasionally, a clever algorithm can be misimplemented. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. 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 Even good code can, good algorithms can go bad sometimes. Yeah. We can also test by having stir find in like over the computer, and stir being found being something like M U T E R. Yeah. Like see if it's gonna detect a P in the middle. Yes. And it should return. Good. Return zero if stir being found is does is. Excellent. Thing. Now, this is, so, excellent. I, I love this discussion. This is exactly what I want when I'm on test cases in your projects. This is what I want you to be able to specify. And I hope you see that each of these could be tested in N unit or J unit or, or Jest or whatever. It could be tested against Mo's code or, or code contributed by others here. These could be tested in a pretty straightforward way. You see what I'm saying? And in fact, you could describe these inputs should yield these outputs. Zero, two, one. And you're, you're testing it. Why do I say this is black box? After all, this is at a low level. It's not about you know, a web form or something. Why am I saying it's black box? Because the user still doesn't need to know how it's input. Yeah, they don't need to know. Is it a fancy algorithm or a straightforward algorithm? Mo may change it. Um, you know, he may change it to a really fancy algorithm at some point that's wicked fast for big strings and, and it can leap forward by just the right amount each time because it knows there's no possibility it's in this next little bit. I think this is what he was referring to. But it doesn't care. These tests should still work against it. Black box, glass box goes on at any level of testing. Unit. Unit integration, integration, system, acceptance. Okay? So, so this is an example of backbox testing at a function level. And it's a quite practical example. What you've given me is exactly the sort of test cases I'm looking for. And I might add that it's the same type of test cases that students in past semesters have sometimes required ID2 or ID3 to get to because they're just not getting to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is you want to be able to provide it with some fixed inputs and you get some known outputs and compare are they correct. Do you understand how these test cases, if you, if you were to implement them in a test framework, say just, you could automate them. You could run through 100 different test cases, right? For, for this case, 
Could you come up with a dozen test cases for this? Yeah. Yeah. Could you come up, if, if I really gave you enough time, like the entire final exam was on this, could you come up with 100 test cases for this? Maybe. Possibly. Yeah, just with different strings. Now, would that be efficient to have 100 for this? Probably not. Would it be, would, it, would you feel confident? Let's suppose that I wrote count instances for the final exam. I had a student write it, and only I know whether it was, there's a bug in it or not. Would you feel confident testing it with zero cases, just trusting that it's, it's going to work correctly? Would you feel comfortable testing it with one or two test cases only? Probably. What's that? Probably not. Probably not. If you tested it with five, would you feel comfortable? I'd feel more comfortable, but not. Good. And, and especially if they were cleverly chosen ones, right? You see what I mean? It wasn't just random ones. You're testing these things we're talking about, these equivalence classes, right? You're testing your AA and AAA. You're testing is A found in AA? Is it found in something that's of zero length? Is it found in something that has the wrong case? If you test it with that, if you could come up with 20 test cases, would you start to feel pretty good? If they were cleverly chosen like that. Yeah. Yeah, good. And that is what I'm looking for from this class. It's a lot of test cases like that. Think about that. Ponder that for the next deliverables. Mm. Um, so that's, that's what a lot of testing is about. It's picking these test cases carefully. In the next bunch of lectures, we're going to be talking about additional ways you pick test cases carefully. You pick them so that they, in a glass box sense, it goes through the code a certain way. It hits certain, it goes this way on this if statement, this other way on this other if statement. You pick your test cases to test out the code in an intelligent, thorough, but not truly exhaustive or wasteful way. Does that make sense? Is what I'm saying making sense? And it's all about risk management. It's all about do you feel you've done enough that you can pass the red face test and say, look, I've tested this pretty well, but I'm not going to waste my time with, with a lot of wasteful test cases. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it works properly with searching A in AA, it probably works OK searching B in BB, right? So it's all about effectiveness and efficiency. Mm? Mm. Balancing those two. Because we don't have all the time in the world. Time is limited. The set of possibilities is unlimited. We want to pick our, our, our test carefully because it has opportunity cost. What do I mean by opportunity cost? If I test this, what's the, what's the implication? You could be testing other things. Yeah. I have limited time. So if I test this, I'm not going to be testing that, inevitably. I can't test everything I want to. If I'm testing these things, it's going to rule out, inevitably, some testing something. So it's about testing intelligently, yeah? And it's about picking the right test cases, not just at random, not just in a desultory sort of playing around way, but picking them so it's a bit intelligent. And I would tell you, and I, I will be emphatic about this, that it's actually a bit fun sometimes to pick clever test cases. You're getting to the heart of the matter. You know, you're, you're seeing, OK, does it hit this? And it makes you think about the implementation. And this is why test-driven, one of the big reasons test-driven development can be so powerful is because it gets you to think cogently through so you don't make mistakes writing the code the first time. Does that make sense? Because you're writing the test first. Yeah? OK. 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 So ladies and gentlemen, so you have a insurance renewal thing, and you have different possibilities. OK. They previously had zero claims. So I don't know if you folks have insurance. Explicitly, if, if you had a car, if you had a house.
house or if you had some other type of, of uh, um, property that you needed to, for which you needed to purchase insurance, you'd realize that, you know, you have a thing called a premium. You pay, say, monthly for your car insurance, let's say. Um, and what your monthly charge is depends on your record of, of risk. So if you've been in more accidents, what do you think? Does it make your so-called premium, the amount you pay monthly, go up or down? Up. Go up, yeah, because it's a bigger risk. They're, they're going to pay you money if you're in an accident. <laughs> and since you're in more likely to be in an accident, they're going to charge you more per, per day per, or per, per month to protect you, <laughs> right? They're going to charge you more. They're going to need more money from you to provide that thousand dollars when you're in an accident to repair your car. Mm -hmm. So here, maybe an insurance claims processor, you know, will have some rules. Okay, if you have zero previous claims, we're sending in a claim for for an accident, and and uh, you know, it's for someone who's 25 or younger. They have an accident now. They've had zero previous claims. We're going to increase them by fifty dollars a month, but we're not going to send them a warning or cancel them. Okay, but maybe maybe if they've had one previous claim and they're twenty five or younger, we're going to raise it by ten, and we're going to send a warning to them. Hey, you better watch out. And if they have two to four claims, don't let this cut too quick, too too close to home. They're 25 or younger, $400 increase, send warning, yes. And at some point for any age, seven, you know, five or more claims, you're gonna cancel them. You say, we're not gonna cover you anymore. Maybe other companies will, but we ain't. Mm -hmm. So this provides a set of possibilities. How might you test this? Um, well, I mean, the simplest way is to test the number of claims um, and the age. Okay, good. So. So do you, do you need to test someone who's 16, who's 17, who's 18, who's 19, who's 20, who's 21, right, and test, one test, yeah, you want to test at least one possibility from each of these categories to make it sure it does the right thing, right? And more specifically, you often want to test um, middle grounds or like breaking points. Okay, that's the idea of boundary value testing, and we're going to get to that next. You probably want to check Give me an age where you might want to check. Um, 19. Okay. Okay. 19, although I don't see anything specifically referenced in 19. Oh, but for boundary checking? Yeah. Uh, 25. Yeah, 25. Because 25 should be handled in this case, but maybe it's been implemented. Have you ever made a mistake like you've written, you know, greater than or equal, it should be greater or vice versa? So other people make that mistake a lot. I've made that mistake, particularly when it's late at night, I'm tired, got, got to get something done quick. So, so often you test those things that are breakpoints because the code might have a problem there. Does that make sense? So, so here, yeah, you might test one for each of these normally, but then you test the, the boundary values, right? Test it at 25. What's another H you might test it at? 26. 26. You test right around the boundaries. Make sure it's handling those in the right way. So I would argue within one to two dozen tests, you could probably test this pretty well. You notice there's, again, these things that are handled for this. this in this case, the equivalence class almost falls out of the analysis, right? This is the equivalence class, and these things should happen, right? Um, and that's good. Now, depending on what sort of system this is, you might also give some invalid things, say when it's a negative number of claims, so the insurer's age is, you know, less than zero or something. But, you know, we'll, we'll leave this like this. And you can document it like this. It's kind of nice. Document it and say, we want to hit each of these leaf nodes where I think different things happen. It's really hitting each of these possibilities. Does that make sense? Ladies and gentlemen, it's about intelligent testing intelligently, testing effectively, but efficiently. Make sense? Okay. Now, 
there's an ugly fact that comes up with cases where we have more than one consideration. We've seen things. Look at this. We have inputs for this, for the number of claims and the insured age. See that? We have to specify both of them, right? Here we have to specify both of these. But imagine a web form where you're, you're asked to enter your name, first name, last name, your age, and maybe your, uh, you know, the, uh, your address. For each of those, a name, you could come up with some equivalence classes, right? Of things that might test it with different names that it might not handle properly, right? Give me a couple, for, for a last name, first name, give me a couple things you might test. Uh, two first names. Good. Another thing? Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Other things? So you're giving it some ones you want to consider invalid. Well, no, the first one was valid. Give me some other things. So remember, you want to test some common ones, too. Uh, just a normal first name. One, one first name. Okay. And uh, last name? Yeah, just a normal last okay. name. Okay. Okay. How about another one? Only a first name and no last name. Only first name, no last name. How about another one? Blank for name both. Name with a apostrophe. Yeah, good, good. Um, name with an exclamation point, like South Africa. They have names that are like. Name with cool. a strange symbol. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Again, it it, it it yeah defines what it, it it comes down to what you mean by strange. But yeah, an, a, a symbol that's not normally seen in right. Canada. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, how about with accents? Right, accents. Yeah. So these are all great things, right? But then, so, so I like these. And we could go on for a while. And once again, if we did it with a couple dozen, we'd probably be pretty confident. We, we've done it with enough to not be embarrassed. Um, now suppose you also have age on that form. And you have address. Are you going to do all possible combinations of them? No, you, you want to test each of them at least somewhat. But to do all possible combinations, like all of those with negative ages, all of those with ages that are legit, all of those with ages that are, not, that are alpha characters, that, it's a huge number of possibilities. You go even just name and age, right? And even, even just first and last name, you've got a whole swack of possibilities. The first name is blank, the second has, has, has a regular name, blank, you know, second name has accents. You can't possibly do, once you get to any number of fields, you, uh, you know, larger number of fields, it becomes intractable and unrealistic to simulate all possibilities. All possible values of each times each other. It goes up combinatorially. What do I mean by combinatorially? Suppose there are 10 possible values for the first one, 10 possible values for the second one. What, do I, what would it mean like if it were, if it rises combinatorially? The total number of possibilities would be 100, 10 times 10, right? In general, if there are A possibilities for the first, B for the second, C for the third, D for the fourth, C times D. And this rises geometrically. I mean, if you had two possibilities for each, already you'd be at 2 to the 4th or 16. If you had 10 possibilities for each, you'd be at 10 to the 4th or 10,000 possibilities for, for testing, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe we have a couple dozen for each one. It, it becomes intractable, and, and, and it becomes kind of wasteful to do all possible combinations of each. So we try to be intelligent about doing, about doing things, okay? We try to handle multiple outputs um, within what's called orthogonal arrays, okay? Um, here, 
we're handling, we're making sure that each variable is tested for all its possibilities. But we don't guarantee that all possible combinations are tested. Each variable has all of its possibilities tested. And there's, in fact, a guarantee stronger than that. Each value, each pair of values is tested. Pair of possibilities. But not all possible combinations of values are tested. Okay, And this actually hugely saves over other tests. So suppose we have variables here, A, which can go A, B, C, D, E. Very, another variable that can go A, J, K, L, I, M. And another variable, yeah, it's uh, V, W, X, Y, Z. And we want to we wanna have all pairs. You notice that each of them has five. So if I considered all possible combinations, what would the number be? Okay, and, and what is that? If, if, uh, 125, yep, 5 cubed. Now, that might not seem overloaded, but imagine if each of these required a script to do gu gu GUI testing. Or imagine if each of these was like, the, the 5 in variable 1 is like 5 different versions of iOS. The second one is 5 different browsers. Safari, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, uh, Lynx. And suppose this third variable is, you know, the type of web server it's hitting or something like that. Configuring all of those possibilities is kind of painful. So what we've guaranteed here, you'll notice it's only 25 test cases, not 125, 25. But you'll notice any pair is in here. Is there an A and an I? Yeah. Is there an A and a J? Yeah. Is there an A and a Z somewhere? Yeah, there is, right here. Is there an A and a W? Yeah. Is there a C and somewhere a, a Z? Yeah, here's a, a, a C and a Z is right here. Yeah. But well. wouldn't it be wrong, since, like, not fully thoroughly, thoroughly tested, since you don't have like an A, a K, and a W? Precisely. It's not all combinations, but it's all pairs. Okay. Now, <clears throat> why might we do this? Well, if you're dealing with systems, like you're dealing with iOS and web browsers or something, and you're trying to see if this certain plugin you have works properly or your website looks properly. Often, whether or not it's working doesn't depend on all three possibilities. It depends on pairwise issues. In other words, it doesn't work on IE in Windows you know, 7 and before, or it doesn't work on on Chrome in Linux. It's a pairwise issue. Often what breaks it, what breaks certain things, often where the bugs come out, it doesn't require all possibilities to be exactly this of three possibilities. Instead, it just requires two of the things to be a certain way. And there's no question, there's 125 possibilities uh, that are possible if we test all possible combinations, and this only tests 25. So there are some possibilities that are clearly missing. But what we have is all pairs. And so often because the problems come up on pairwise incompatibility, you know, not it's a problem with Chrome on iOS when we're, you know, when we're going over only data connection or something like that. Um, rather it's Chrome on iOS in all cases. This will still be more likely, this will likely catch most bugs. Is it perfect? No. There are some things left out of this that in principle there could be an error, but errors are much more likely to occur on a pairwise basis than a triplet basis. Some errors do occur, you know, in this very special set of conditions, but those sort of errors are also less likely to affect what? 
begins with a U. User. user. Because there's a lot fewer people who have exactly this possibility um, uh, of all three being a certain way. Pairwise issues are much more likely to affect someone. So yeah. this is us assuming that yeah. V1, V2, V3 are all semi-independent. Uh, this, this is a good point. So, um, so variable one, two, and three here. You'll notice here that it's kind of, you could choose one without worrying about the names of the yeah. others. But for example, and, and you know, I like the way you're thinking, Mo, um, Internet Explorer is not gonna be on iOS. <laughs> yeah. You know, or, or it's not gonna be on, on uh, yeah, say on, on iOS, or you're not going to have um, IO, Internet Explorer and Linux. So, to best of my knowledge. So, so the point is, in fact, that also constrains often what the possibilities are. This is in the hardest case where they're all independent, and therefore they're the largest number of possibilities. Um, the beauty is, though, that this, so this can occur for like combinations of, of configurations, which is kind of nice. You're testing the fonts and the screen size and the display mode. The nice thing is you can do this with an arbitrary number of variables. It's not just three. You can do this with 10 variables, 10 items on your form that you have to fill in. You know, your age, your sex, your, your name, your address, your years of education, you know, et cetera. And you can still do this. And it becomes more and more efficient, more and more efficient as the number of possibilities goes up. Um, you go from, this is 100% coverage to this. This is all possibilities. I'm not gonna wait around to that finishes, and I hope you won't either. This is the number of possibilities with orthogonal array. What is orthogonal array getting? All possible pairs of values. Ladies and gentlemen, we typically don't have the option of exhaustive, te exhaustive testing. There's not enough time. There's not enough testers to write the scripts. There's not enough patience. There's not enough machines to run different configurations on, even virtual machines. So we make do. We test, we try to test intelligently. We try to test not only effectively, but efficiently. And one way to do that is to test pairwise. We guarantee all possibilities are there, even if we can't guarantee all possibilities uh, of combinations, right? We test pairwise, we're sure that we've tested everything. So could there still be some we're not testing that there's an error? Absolutely. And that's just about inevitable. You're never going to be able to test all possible things. But at least test so you're not embarrassed. <laughs> at least test so the obvious likelihoods are dealt with. Will things fall through the cracks? Yes. And you can learn from them. But if, at least if you can do the, the basic testing, it won't be something that crashes with a large number of users on a common basis, sullies your reputation, and make people no want to not want to secure your services anymore. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, one thing I've skipped that uh, I'll come back to next time. Well, I, I didn't skip it, I referred to it, but it's this boundary value testing that Jesse referred to. And this notion of testing things at the edges. Testing things at the edges between boundary, between orthogonal, um, between um, uh, equivalence classes, okay? We'll come back to that next time, along with some little exercises I'd like you to think about before next time. I will post these slides and I'd like you to think about things. Equivalence classes and boundary values for arguments to these functions, okay? I'd like you to think about that and we'll talk about it next time. And we'll push further into test case selection, okay? Thank you very much for your attention and if you could let me know if anyone's on call or if you want to show up at quarter six. Uh, we'll probably be in uh, Thorv uh, 274, okay, which is a conference room right on next to the central stairs of the hotel. Okay, thank you very much.